So good, good morning, everyone. Uh, I apologize for starting a couple minutes late. We had some technical difficulties this morning, but it's my honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Treblani from the University of Pittsburgh, a professor of ophthalmology there, and an absolute powerhouse in, in the field of uh, vitro-retinal and choroidal imaging. I will hand it over to Dr. Peng Yan to do the formal introduction. So Dr. Yan, you take it away, please. Do I, do I stand right here? Hey, I'm in yes, the, yes, that's I perfect. Thank here. you. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm in the right spot. So anyways, Eric, good morning, everyone. It's an honor to introduce to you this morning our uh, distinguished guest, Dr. Jay Chablani. So he is a professor of ophthalmology and vitro retinal surgery at the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh, the director of clinical research at the UPMC Vision Institute, where he established the choroid analysis and research lab. Um, which focuses on the computational and biological research in the field of choroid, uh, which is going to be the new frontier of um, our retinal imaging. Uh, his area of interest includes uh, the choroid, the macular disorder, artificial intelligence, automated retinal imaging analysis, advanced imaging technique. He has been consistently funded by the National Institute of Health and various foundations. He has published uh, over um, 600 articles in peer-reviewed journal. Um, so I made the calculation that means 60 articles over the past 10 years. It's um, it's quite astonishing. Um, he's also the editor of books, Choroid Disorder, Serious Choroid Retinopathy, and Choroid Neurovascularization. He holds numerous positions in review and editorial board of high-impact journal, including Science Translational Medicine, Lancet, the American Journal of Ophthalmology, and he serves as a grand review board of various funding agencies. He's a member of many esteemed societies, including the Macular Society and the Golden Club. Is a member of various scientific committees, including uh, the American Academy of Ophthalmology. He delivered over 200 invited uh, guest lectures and uh, VPP rounds uh, around the world. Uh, but finally, his dream was coming true to come to Toronto to deliver this VPP round. Uh, he has won several national and international awards and delivered multiple named lectures. So the list goes on. It's too long to list. Um, and yes, he does have a life outside of medicine he didn't share. He has a beautiful family of two kids, and he enjoys playing chess and ping pong. And hockey. <laughs> right, and hockey too. So um, please join me, and we look for, forward to your great presentation this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, on on behalf of uh, Peng, I would like to apologize for the long CV. I did not plan that he'll be presenting the whole. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much for inviting me to this um, dream come true visiting professor uh, <laughs> presentation. And <clears throat> uh, we I'll be talking about choroidal imaging. I believe that uh, there is, will be a mixed audience starting from first year residents to the retina attending. So I decided to you know cover up from all the grounds. And I was just talking to Sandra that how the field is expanding so much. And every year we dump 100 more articles on our junior colleagues to read and know about it when they started some reading something which was 30 years old published. So we are just expanding and adding more and more. So let's get started with uh, choroidal imaging updates. These are my financial disclosure. Unfortunately, none of them are related to my presentation, uh, hopefully soon. Uh, so, so we all understand that the choroid is the layer which is in the back of the eye, which is pretty much made with vasculature. And we understand that there are three types of vasculature. I would not call three layers of vasculature because unlike retina, the choroidal blood vessels are not arranged as a layer on top of each other, but there are three types of blood vessels ranging from smallest, that is choriocapillaries, to the largest, that is heller vessels. Why it is important? Because the choroid supplies the oxygen, the nutrition to the photoreceptors, so the choroid plays a very important role uh, uh, for the health of the retina. Is it okay if we can turn off the lights? Because my presentations are usually black and white like OCT, so it's always good to have the contrast. Great, thank you. Um, we all have been looking at the choroid for many, many years. We started with uh, endocyanin green angiography, which gave us some clues about the choroid, but there was no quantification available. Then we started uh, using ultrasound, which actually, I still remember the days when we actually measured the choroid uh, on ultrasound to understand the choriosclerotic thickness, but now those days are gone because now we have uh, EDI OCT, which came almost uh, more than a decade ago. 
And now we have swept source OCT, which is almost as good as histology pictures where we can see the individual layers of the choroidal blood vessels. And that is where most of our research is focused on. So today I'll be talking about something called as choroidal analytics. It starts with qualitative and quantitative. We will be taking you through uh, a qualitative analysis uh, tools such as hyperpermeability, vascular patterns, bulbosity, tortuosity, and we'll be talking about this, the, the value of straightening and curvature of the choroidal vessels. Along with that, we'll be talking about various quantitative uh, analytical tool which our lab has produced in the last uh, decade or so. So let's start with qualitative analysis of the choroid. Before we really get onto the qualitative analysis, I always love this paper, which really talks about how does the vortex vein on the OCT look in healthy eyes? I believe before we really understand what happens in pathology, we need to know how does things look in healthy eyes. So you can have normal variation of the, the Heller vessels, as you can see in this image from this publication, where there is there are Heller vessels which are coming from top and bottom. You can see that there is a clear watershed zone. The vessels are not crossing. There is no anastomosis. This is considered normal. What else is normal? There is a possibility that you know the vessels are crossing, but no anastomosis. Again, it is normal. And you can also have some form of anastomosis, as we can see in this picture, where there is a crossing, there is anastomosis, uh, and this also could be considered as healthy eyes. So they published something very interesting that you know you can always have anastomosis in around 44% of the eye. You can have uh, uh, crossing, but the, when you see these vessels, there is no narrowing of the vessels. They are, though they are anastomosing, but there is no narrowing. And they also related with the age, different age groups, but they did not find any significant association in terms of the deviation of uh, horizontal watershed zone. And there was some relationship with the choroidal thickness, saying that thicker choroid tend to have a higher macular vortex vein anastomosis. Now we know what is normal, let's look at what is abnormal. And I'm sure that you all are interested in pachychoroid eyes. So before we get onto the images, I would like you to go through these points, uh, which we findings we see in pachychoroid, which is loss of watershed zone, narrowing towards watershed zone, dilation, as well as dilation of the ampulla, as well as anastomosis. Let's look at some of these pictures. So here you can see clearly that there is crossing, there is anastomosis, and you can correlate it with the OCT angio picture on the right, which actually shows that there is there is uh, abnormal choroidal vascular neovascularization, which is corresponding to the area which has been affected by these large choroidal vessels. And on ICG at the bottom, you can see that you can clearly see the Heller vessels. At the same time, I want you to understand that just look at the on fast images on the top row and the ICG on the bottom row. You can clearly see that the on fast images are actually now showing you as good as what we could see on ICG. So now we are moving our uh, uh, analysis as well as uh, evaluation of the choroid to the structural on fast OCT as shown on the top image. And here you can see one more example of the pachychoroid where the things are going more on the nasal side, which is in the peripapillary region. If you see these large choroidal vessels on the nasal side, you realize that this this probably is going towards something called as peripapillary uh, pachychoroid syndrome, where we will be discussing later today. And you can look at the cross-section uh, image of B. B clearly shows that how the choroid is distinctly taken on the nasal side of the fovea instead of the temporal, where you can see that because of the thicker choroid and the larger choroidal vessels, the nasal choroid is thickened. Though there are no, there is, uh, no obvious track, I cannot, I cannot see it, but you can clearly see that the pachychoroid, which is more on the nasal side, is contributing to this uh, choroidal neovascular membrane as well as the subretinal fluid. And what about this image here? You can see that how the large choroidal vessels are so thick, they are like really um, en enlarged. And there's something similar we can see even on the cross-sectional image. And you can see that the RP changes as well as the abnormal choroidal vascularization seen on OCT NGO. So certainly the choroidal vessels is very important. And we, all, we wanted to look into the various choroidal vascular pattern ranging from 
reticular pattern to herringbone pattern, cross eyes are a mixed pattern. And we notice that the reticular pattern is more common in CSR eyes compared to the herringbone in the fellow eyes. So what about bulbosity and tortuosity? And this paper from Rick Speed uh, showed that on ICG, they wanted to look into the bulbosity, as you can see on the figure on the left, and the tortuosity, which is again very common in eyes with pachycori. What about white field ICG? I think this is becoming more and more useful in terms of figuring out why this patient has pachycoroid, and that is where we are able to see these vortex veins beautifully in the periphery. And we have done some of the work in these uh, white field ICG as well. Uh, we published together with Chris Spade uh, the concept of, of uh, vortex venous choroidopathy, where you can see that how this anastomosis and the crossing is going on even in the periphery. And this is why probably there is a thick choroid. There are thicker choroidal vessels because probably the condition is going on in the peripheral vortices. And now the, now we are looking into that whether there is scleral changes as well as uh, what kind of treatment we can offer to these patients who have engorged vortex veins in the periphery. Uh, we also talk nowadays more frequently about something called as choroidal vascular hyperpermeability where you can see that the choroidal vessels are leaking, which we knew 30 years ago. But now we know that, you know, these choroidal vessels are actually leaking also in the peripheral areas, not just the macular region. That means that you have the pathology going on in the periphery as well. And now we call this CVH, uh, the abbreviation is CVH for hyperpermeability very often. And I'll be talking about some more in, in a few slides. Uh, many of these devices are able to offer you choroidal thickness maps. And just by looking at uh, your choroidal thickness map, which is shown here on the right bottom, uh, you can figure out that you know, the choroid is much thicker in the center. It is thicker along the choroidal vessels, as we can see uh, on the ICG as well. So, But just by looking at the thickness map, earlier we spoke about retinal edema. Now we can talk about Choroidal thickens, a choroid is thickened, and there are large choroidal vessels just by looking at the thickness map as well. Let's move on to the quantitative analysis of the choroid, which is primarily my area of interest for the last 10 years. And uh, we start with choroidal thickness. Maybe around 15 years ago, we started measuring the choroidal thickness at the subfovea. Then many of the publications came that you can do the repetitive uh, measurements on 1,000 microns, 750 microns. And then we came up with the concept of uh, measuring the Heller vessel thickness, as you can see on this image, uh, where we are able to do the measurement of the inner choroid as well as Heller vessel. And now we have the thickness maps which are available for individual vascular layers, such as co inner choroidal blood vessels as well as uh, Heller vessel thickness maps. Uh, way back in 2012, we were looking into volumetric analysis of the choroid, and you can imagine that doing the choroidal segmentation manually for uh, 100 scans for each eye was very difficult. So our focus was to come up with the automated segmentation, which we definitely did. But at the same time, we realized that if you binarize these images, you can actually come up with something called as choroidal vascularity index for the whole volume, which is nothing but the, uh, but the vessel, which is shown as a darker pixel divided by the total choroidal area. And this became one of the important biomarkers. And I, I feel very happy that many of these publications are using CBI as a, one of the uh, analytic tools when they are talking about the choroid. Uh, then we took this forward, this uh, choroidal vascularity into the choroidal vascularity map, which is pretty much uh, the same what we are looking into the retinal thickness map. That's why we borrowed ETDRS uh, from, the, uh, from the machines and took this ETDRS and came up with the concept of choroidal vascularity map, which is showing you these choroidal vascularity in individual areas. When we did this, we were like, okay, that's really cool, but what do we do with this? Then we realized that you know we can actually try to relate it between the eyes, and we learned that uh, if you look at the CVI map, there is an increase in CVI towards the center compared to the peripheral sectors into the CSR eyes, but then we wanted to correlate with the leak focal site. So we picked up cases where there was a focal leak and correlated with the CVI map. And very surprisingly, we noticed that the CVI map was pretty much the same. It was I was expecting that the CVI could be much higher 
in the areas where there's leakage, but actually the CVI was very high. Again, which set up the evidence that probably the choroid is thick and all around it is just one spot which is leaking. That means you have to deal with a much bigger pathology area than just the focal area, which also establishes the role of PDT in these eyes. We were also looking into the hyperreflective dots in the choroid, and we came up with uh, the automated uh, counting of these choroidal hyperreflectivity dots. We looked into the CSR and other diseases, and I'll just show you one of the cases in VKH where you can see that there are multiple uh, choroidal hyperreflective dots when the patient presented to us with active lesion. And when you treated the patient with steroids, and here you can see that the choroid has not only reduced in the size, or the thickness has reduced, the fluid has gone, but the choroidal hyperreflective dots also came down, which again established that means uh, the, the role of inflammation in these eyes, and that is where the steroids are much more useful. Uh, some of the groups from Japan particularly have been working very closely uh, on uh, a white field ICG. They have come up with the concept of choroidal vascular density, where you can actually take a segment and binarize the image and come up with the choroidal vascular density, something similar to CVI, but by using white field ICGA. And then recently, we have been talking about choroidal vascular brightness. Uh, you can understand that when you are dealing with an image like this, where there is so much going on and you know probably the brightness of the of the vessel itself could be determining the worsening of the disease so that's why it was important to look into the choroidal vascular brightness and recently i have been working very closely with uh, my collaborator in japan where uh, in korea where we are looking into quantifying the choroidal vascular hyperpermeability like i discussed in the initial slides and now we are able to quantify the difference in the leakage, which is considered as hyperpermeability. And this is becoming more important in terms of predicting what your patient is going to uh, be in few years. So right now we are working on this um, parameter and hopefully we'll be able to use it at individual levels such as posterior pole, mid periphery and the far periphery by using these optos wide field images. Uh, there are numerous parameters. I can go on for one more hour on this, but now we have choroid is the hot topic and everybody's like trying to figure out how do we actually assess our patients. And this is the list of uh, various uh, parameters using wide field ICDA. So what was, leaking, uh, what was lacking? So I've been working on this uh, choroid for almost now 13 years. And then we kept thinking what else is missing? We have looked into the vessels, we have looked into the, the thickness, then we thought that what is missing is the surface evaluation. We are not able to understand how the overall surface of the choroid is because if you look at various diseases, you will see that why the choroidal curvature is so changed and that is where we came up with the concept of choroidal contour mapping, uh, which is nothing but you just don't look at the vessel or the thickness, but just take the surface of the choroid and separate them as inner and outer here you can see. And now you will be able to see on this video that how we are able to separate out the surface of the choroid and how individual surfaces can be evaluated by using this 3D uh, visualization. And uh, this is the inner surface of the choroid. And uh, the video on uh, the, the piece on the right is the outer surface. And here you can see that how the whole curvature is different. And we did not stop here, but we actually looked into the quantitative evaluation of the surface. I had to go through this complex mean and maximum principal curvature after maybe 25 years, but we wanted to look into more details that how do we quantify the curvature? And we learned that, you know, if I really pick up these three examples, the top one is the AMD, the, the middle one is the healthy, and the bottom one is the CSR. And here you can see, just by looking at the pictures, you can figure out that how the curvature itself is different between these three diseases. And there is a definite increase in the curvature. And we also looked into various quantitative analytical uh, parameters, and we learned that there was a distinct difference between these three um, study groups, and this paper should be soon getting accepted. We also looked into the healthy database of our 100 patients, and we realized that as you are growing old, 
from less than 30 to more than 60, there is a decrease in the radius of curvature. So you can imagine there is so much going on. I'm sure that the thickness is also changing as we know with age, but there is certainly a change in the curvature as well. I'm still not sure that whether we can actually use it for some understanding the diseases, but we still believe that uh, this is a novel 3D imaging biomarker. And we understand that uh, the radius of curvature increases from AMD to CSR. Right now, we are looking into the effect of PDT on the curvature changes into eyes with CSR. And we believe that probably the curvature may give us the early clue of change in the disease profile. Uh, let's not stop here. We take you forward to 3D coroidal imaging, which is what I wanted to do 10 years ago. And now we finally have some results uh, of the struggle with uh, spectral, dom um, spectral domain OCT to step source OCT. And these are some of uh, our lab work where now we are able to segment out the Heller vessels and we can now see these individual vessels. And you can see that those numbers which are moving along with the video are the, the vascular volume of the individual sectors. And now we are able to segment out each of these uh, uh, blood vessels. Uh, uh, we wanted to get into further details, and this is just a, a video of healthy eyes of the previous version, which I showed you. And if I want to really get into the detail into an individual vessel, I can grab one of these vessels, look into the diameter of the blood vessel, as well as the um, uh, constrictions, as well as the curvature change, as well as the torsional index. I am most excited about this work at this point of time. And this is just an example of one of my CSR patients from, taken in, on swap source. You look into the choroidal vessels, you can clearly see that empty spaces. There is certainly a straightening of the blood vessels, which we also saw on um, and on Faso City. Now let's look at one of these vessels from the CSR. And here you can clearly see that how these choroidal vessels have these focal constrictions. And this is something which is now corresponding to what we were discussing about bulbosity and tortuosity. Now we can see in live in our patients. So now we are working into the 3D quantification of the vessel volume, tortuosity index, as well as the void volumes. And I believe that these parameters are going to be very useful for the future. This is some of the work where we were trying to separate out the choriocapillaries, but I am not um, very happy with this work. So we have stopped working on this because we don't trust the choriocapillary segmentation on OCT NGO. So we are trying to see that what else can we do, which I'll show you in the next few slides. So what was missing so far? We, we spoke about the curvature, thickness, vessel, but we didn't do, we still don't know how the flow is. And that is where we wrote a grant, and this is something which I'm working with adaptive optics teams where we are looking into uh, using an AO ICG. So you inject the ICG dye and look into the dye entry and exit of the choriocapillaries so you can quantify the vasculature as well as visualize the choriocapillaries because that is still uh, uh, the holy grail. We still don't know much about that. So this work is the goal is to actually try to match something uh, with uh, some of the temp uh, images, but this is something which is very challenging because by the time you move your focus of 1.5 degrees from one area to another area, the dye is already out. So, so we are still figuring out what else can we do to get the better quantification of the choreocapillary flow. But at the same time, we have established a second instrument in the world called laser Doppler holography along with our collaborator from Paris, um, Michel Pack and Michael Atlan. And here, this is a non-invasive laser Doppler holography where we are able to look into the retinal as well as uh, uh, choroidal vasculature. And you can see that the details which we can see without injecting the dye is astonishing. And not only that, we can actually see the, the vessel uh, velocity. And you can see that this velocity is actually changing with systole and diastole, and you can now look at to the retinal vessels as well as choroidal vessel velocity by doing a non-invasive imaging such as uh, LDH. Uh, what is uh, one more very unique thing which I am more uh, interested on LDH is that this is the only instrument which can actually separate out the choroidal vessel, the choroidal arteries from choroidal veins because none of the imaging devices, we, can, we, we know that whether it is the artery or the vessel, but if you look at the image on the left, you can see that 
how the blue and the red is separating the artery and the veins in, in the choroid as well. However, we are yet to reach into the choroidal vascular volume as well as the velocity by using this system. Our goal is to push this to a 3D, but um, we are there in terms of the white field ILDH because I'm trying to mimic this into a 3D uh, vasculature on what we see on white field ICG. So we are we are almost reaching to 60 degrees, but the goal is to go further periphery by averaging more uh, individual vessels. But there is a lot of challenges, as you can see in this image. Uh, I just wanted to bring up something very important because all this cool work is really nice to a clinician, but there is a lot go into the background where we actually have to go through a lot of steps in evaluating these images and making everything automated because the manpower is always low, right? So uh, we are hoping, we, we were working into the choroidal image quality and this paper we published last year, where we are trying to see that can we create a pipeline where we just dump all our choroidal images and they get evaluated in terms of the quality check and the good images get separated and move forward to further analysis such as this. So we all agree that we have had these uh, uh, image data for more than now 15, 20 years but what to do with this data? And this is something was a very important question to us. So that is where we came up with using the super resolution to improve the choroidal quality. Here you can see that the image on the left, which is an original image when you do the automated segmentation, which is the a second column here, you can see that the automated segmentation fails. But if you do super resolution of these images, and on the fourth column, you can see that how after super resolution, automated segmentation is much more accurate. And, and these are very important things to do because if you really want to scale up our um, analysis as well as uh, applying more AI into this, so we need to get this as a background uh, work. We also wanted to uh, do something called as choroidal synthesis, and this is... Uh, very, very important, not just to for us to, you know, fill up the gaps when we are working on the volumetric data. So if you have a poor quality image, you can actually fill that gap by creating an, an, an artificial choroidal image so we can, our algorithm don't get messed up. So, but not only that, but also in terms of the data protection, because now I'm sure you guys are aware that all the IRBs are freaking out because now you can uh, now the fundus images are also going to be uh, considered as part of the HPI. So now we had to come up with artificial images and we wanted to go ahead of the curve and create artificial choroidal images. And this is some of the most exciting work which we published uh, last year, where we are able to create these choroidal images, train the model, and then come up with uh, the volumetric analysis, what we wanted for every image. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to conclude saying that there is lots to do on the choroidal imaging. The 10 years have passed by achieving only this much, but now we have goals to push this forward to much wider uh, imaging as well as get into more vascular and flow images. And obviously we want to make everything non-invasive. And as you saw that, now we have to talk about surface as well as uh, 3D vascular uh, imaging as well. Uh, this all is not possible without the funding sources, so I would like to thank all my funding agencies and the collaborator, and this is a huge team um, behind these people. Uh, there are a few more uh, which are working very hard to achieve what we want to achieve. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, that that was fantastic. As a, as a non-retina person, I am just um, constantly amazed at the technology and advancement in your field. And a big credit goes to folks like you who are clearly brilliant minds who continue to push the field forward. So, you know, on behalf of the specialty of ophthalmology, you know, thank you for your efforts. I think it's, we need people like yourself who, you know, think outside the box, push the limits and uh, help advance uh, our knowledge. So I thought that was an excellent presentation. Uh, we do have a couple of retina folks um, on our panel. I don't know if they have any questions or comments. We got Dr. Altamari, Dr. Wong, Dr. Kaplan, and one of our fellows, Dr. Batawi. I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering if when you have a crotal tumor, whether benign or a, a malignant event, does that change the, uh, or is there any, any 
question or any evidence to show any change in the vascularity in the choroid, whether attenuation or increased flow or change in the parameters that you've identified, whether it be contour, CBI, and so on. I've noticed in some cases you can actually see at the edge of the tumor some kind of undulation of the RPE in choroid. And it was interesting to hear what, what you may say about that. I'm sorry. Uh, there was one more. Uh, someone else was also speaking. Uh, anyways, I'll, I'll try to answer your question. Thank you so much uh, for the question. And you figured that I don't do oncology because none of the slides had oncology. <laughs> However, I have contributed uh, with some of the folks where we were interested into uveitis, choroidal granuloma, as well as oncology. One, I mean, I'm pretty sure that the vascularity is changing and definite there is an impact of the treatment on the uh, tumorous uh, growth in the choroid as well as the granuloma because uh, these are some of the cases where we always fail to image the choroid to the outermost extent. So, so we agree that the, by looking at the qualitative images, we can say that there was a rejection in the vascularity, but we have failed to segment these things automated and really come up with uh, the analysis of the CVI. But uh, certainly there is a difference in the choroidal vessels on that. Thank you. Yeah. One additional question uh, quickly. Um, is there any change relative, you know, the choroidal contour, for example, relative to the axial length? Uh, yes, we did find that there is an impact of the axial length. However, we are yet to look into the high myopic data because for our healthy cohort, we did include only between 24 to 25, just to just to make sure that we do we avoid the influence of the axial length. But certainly, but I'll tell you something more interesting that I feel that the axial length axial length influences the choroidal contour. But it is also possible that if you have a staphyloma, which is away from the fovea, the axial length mm -hmm. can still be good, but the contour will be affected. So uh -huh. certainly. You know, there is so much to do on that. And again, they, you need to really manually segment the choroid and then train the model for 1,000 images. But uh, there is definitely an impact. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, David. Hey, um, uh, Jay, that's fantastic as always. You always get a great presentation. Um, you. Question, you know, it always comes up at our meetings is, what's the true definition of pachychoroid? And, you know, you've done so much work on this. And, uh, you know, and the other question is, is how much asymmetry do we see in patients with, uh, with, with the choroidal uh, uh, differences in, in the two eyes? Uh, great question, David. The great question, this has been great for the last 10 years, honestly. <laughs> uh, but I'll be talking to residents on what is pachychoroid. But just to give you a brief, I think by now we know that the thick choroid is not pachychoroid. So if you have a thickened choroid, that should not be called as pachychoroid unless you actually have thicker choroidal vessels, as well as you have the, the straightening of the vessels on on fast, as well as they should be crossing the macular area. If So I think we should not just stay on one kind of imaging to call something pachychoroid and cross-sectional OCT is not the answer for pachychoroid. You need to have an on-fast OCT. And I think the pachychoroid definition has to have a couple of pieces, thick choroid, uh, larger vessels with much straightening as well as crossing. And I think that all should become part of the definition instead of just calling this as thick choroid. Thank you. I and see. So the se sorry, sec and the second question, and Jay, is oh, yeah. how much asymmetry do we see in, in the choroid? Uh, uh, very, yeah, very good question. And I think that this is why our interest is focused on the healthy eyes, and you'll be surprised. And the initial sites, which I was showing, that almost there is a variation of 30 to 40% of these eyes differ between age group as well as between inter eyes as well. So I think there is so much to learn on this, but more important thing to me is that uh, if you really look at these asymmetric presentations of the choroidal vessels, not calling them as pachychoroid, if you see at the asymmetric presentation, then you should actually 
follow these cases up and figure out that how do they predict it. And this is why I think we need to come up with more non-invasive tools such as LDH, where we will be able to actually see that if there is a flow change, what is predicting or making this particular eye in the right eye, why does the only right eye develop CSR? Why not the left one? So I think there are far too many questions uh, to be answered on this. Yeah. Great, thing. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, um, First of all, congratulations on your most innovative uh, talk and exploration and diagnostic explanation of how to examine the uh, this very important layer of the eye. Uh, for a comprehensive ophthalmologist or a non-retina specialist, is there any advice that you can give us as to when we should suspect that something is going on with the choroid? And if are there any uh, readily available imaging devices that the comprehensive or the subspecialist outside of retina can do to uh, diagnose this? Or should we be sending all of these, if we suspect it, to, to retina? Um, yeah. A very common question. I would start by saying that the first thing for all of us, I still am still learning, First thing for all of us is that when you look at a OCT, always look below the RP because there is lots going on below the RP. And if you start looking at the choroid on your cross-sectional images, your eyes will get trained that, you know, whether it is normal, oh yeah, I see a thicker choroid just under the, when you diagnose a CSR in your clinic, just look at the choroid, yeah, there is thicker choroid. But then eventually along with this just slow, learning and observation, there are multiple tools which are already becoming part of these devices. I know that Topcon has it and Zeiss is, Zeiss is not having it, but uh, they are going to have it very soon where you can you are going to have a choroidal thickness maps as well. So when you look at the thickness maps, you will see that why this area is red, why that area is yellow. So that itself is going to tell us that, oh, I need to pay a little bit more attention to that. And I think uh, this all will is going to become more and more popular as well as more and more easy to interpret. And I think uh, uh, more devices are coming up uh, where we are going to have the more significant choroidal analysis available to everybody. Do you think Not these will be age adjusted so that when we look at a 40 year old, we can compare that differently than uh, yeah the, exactly like that's a good year old. question and i think that is where we all are missing into that because i have a lot of interest in the ethnic influence on the choroid so i do a lot of uh, uh i do collaborate with a lot of people and i think um, if you really go back into your ocd days maybe 20 years ago uh, we had a normative data which population is that we don't know which ethnicity, we don't know. So now we it is the time that we have to build up this normative data say, set for each ethnic group. But first we need to figure out what is normal. So uh, there is a lot of things to be done where we have to, this database is something which I really feel. And, and if you ask me as a researcher, it is hardest to get healthy population, which is truly healthy, who does not have blood pressure. And now I have a... Uh, now I have a um, collaboration with OBGYN and we are looking into the choroid of uh, a woman who had uh, placenta previa 10 years ago. So I don't know whether to call this a healthy person, like who is healthy? I still don't know. <laughs> One last so, question. Yeah. What should yeah. we be looking at clinically that would tip us off that we should really be looking at the choroid here? Uh what will the patient come in complaining of? Yeah, so so patient may, I wish patient could say that I have a problem in my choroid, like they say, I have a problem in my retina. But uh, uh, I would say one of the common things where we actually, we were looking into that. I don't uh, uh, blame anybody else, but myself that we always looked into patients. We started thinking of choroidal problem when the patient did not respond to the treatment. So I think just we have to bring that threshold much lower. That would help. For example, I'll tell you, especially if the residents are sitting here, I should share this story that, you know, I had a patient with CSR. I was treating the patient for 
three years, I did two PDTs, never responded. And one day, all of a sudden, by mistake, I got the printout of the vertical scan of the OCT, vertical scan, because you always print the horizontal. I got a vertical scan. And I, I realized that, oh, this is not CSR. This is actually a dome-shaped macula. So this was shocking to me, but that happened maybe in 2014. But this did happen to me that, you know, we did not look at all the scans. So I think the step one is take efforts to go and look into the volume data. Just don't look at the printout because when you scroll through the volume of n number of healthy eyes, one day you will find something abnormal. And I, I always tell the fellows and the resident, always question yourself. And if you question, you are going to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, more philosophical answer than the scientific. <laughs> okay. Yeah, please. Jay, I'll, if there's still more time, uh, Amadeep, um, you know, these yeah. are always fascinating areas. And Jay, you, again, you've done so much work in this area. So it's funny, interesting, in the last couple of years, a bit, uh, Sraf, uh, Vasada, myself, and, and uh, um, Andrew Chang, have, and Raymond Tendioni uh, from France, have been looking at PEDs, and, and especially in AMDs, obviously, is a big thing. But is, what is the relationship of PEDs and formation and anything with the choroid um, that you've seen? Because that, that's a huge area in our AMD that we're really starting to dive into. Uh, so... I, I think the PED definitely, the choroid definitely plays a role somewhere in formation of the PED. I would say just step back and look into the eyes which just have PED and we blame them as CSC. And if you look at those eyes, you will see that the inner choroid has started thinning in one area and the, and the pecky vessel is actually taking over. And in terms of when we move on to the AMD, I understand that the choroid is very thin in AMD, unlike pecky choroid. But if you just look at even in the AMD eyes, you will see that the choroid is thin, but majority is being occupied by the large choroidal vessel. So the story is same. It is just the difference in the thickness. So the large choroidal vessels are now occupying more area of the choroid. And that is what is actually probably uh, causing damage to the RP, uh, the Brooks membrane and the RP, and eventually leading to the for PD formation or in the story of uh, formation of the abnormal blood vessels in that area. Uh, still like not sure, but that's what I could imagine. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, you had a question, please. I was wondering, because in a way you are um, systematically trying to characterize the choroid uh, with the natural history of the healthy eyes, when you approach the Inu um, and you're filming measurements of different uh, uh, qualities of the image, do you, how do you um, decide what to measure? Do you use other parts of the body and try to project the imaging to decide you know, if it's a Okay, I'll just repeat the question because I doubt they could hear you. <laughs> uh, so the question here is that which parameter do you get started first on? And Yeah, so the question here is that, you know, which parameter do you use and do you use other uh, imaging tools as well, even from even imaging of the body? So I think it all depends what you want to do. If you are in the clinic and you have a patient with CSR or VKH, then try to measure the choroidal thickness. And that obviously has become one of the parameters to follow. But if you want to uh, say that uh, you want to do some research in terms of understanding how the choroid is changing after the treatment, or uh, how does it correlate with the ICG? So it all depends what kind of question you have. Is it just the patient management? So probably just in the clinic, choroidal thickness, I think should be done for every patient. And if you are thinking about looking into the, uh, like say that you, have, you see a patient with CSC and you decide that, should I get an ICG done? or sh what should I do, whether there's CNV or not. 
So you can always get an OCT NGO done as well as a swap source OCT. We are lucky that we have Lexalite, which is uh, uh, on fast structural is as good as uh, ICG as you saw. But in those cases, you can always get an on fast OCT. Even in Zeiss uh, uh, 5000 also, you get a great on fast images. You can look into the choroidal vessels and see whether it is actually contributing as a pachychoroid spectrum or not. And then if you want to get an ICG done, you can always correlate with the diffuse leakage areas. If your question is that, okay, I got an ICG, oh, I got an ICG, there is choroidal uh, vascular permeability. I see uh, an on fast OCT, there is thickened choroidal vessels. What do I do with it? So I personally do PDT in the much wider areas. I like to do PDT in areas where there's diffuse leakage as well as well as wherever I see, I usually use on fast structural to understand the extent of the disease. And if I see that the disease is extending beyond my one leakage area, I would rather treat the whole thing. And that is what we were trying to look into the CVI map. I hope I answered your question. Maybe I can ask for a while. I was sort of wondering more like as a researcher when you're approaching this um, like novel imaging Okay, so the question is that what is the inspiration to come up with so many choroidal biomarkers? And I would say the biggest inspiration for me is my fellows and the, the research fel uh, trainees, because they ask questions which I don't know, and then we ended up finding the answer. So when you are working on one project, then you, when we actually, if you really want to know that how we have reached this far is that in 2012, I just wanted to create a 3D choroidal vessel model, which I showed in the last few slides, which actually is still going on and we are still working to improve it. That was the question way back in 2012. And then we started looking into, in those days we did not have swept sword. So we started looking into the choroidal thickness and then I wanted to separate the, the vessels. How do we separate the vessels? Then we decided let's do let's do binarization. And then we came up with the concept of CVI. And then we were thinking about CVI. So as a clinician, I al also always want to know that does it any make any like sense to use it? Because we have been using about retinal thickness map. So why not choroidal thickness map? So this all is like one after other answering few questions and then thinking loud that, you know, what else can we actually look into analyzing it? Yeah, please. Given that Hodgkin said the CD causes CDI would be would be higher in that one area of total leakage for that CSRG, but it was ubiquitously elevated. Mm -hmm. Why did you think, why is there then one area that can be compared to other? So, yeah, that's part of being old. So, uh, <laughs> So uh, when we when we did fluorescein angiography, we always saw a leak. We thought that is the area of problem. We did the laser, patient did well, then he came back after a few months. Uh, so that's what I thought that probably if you look at the focal choroidal thickness of the pachy vessel there, you will see that it is thickened. And yes, this is the problem site, but when you look at the overall vascularity, then you realize that, oh, the problem is much wider than that focal area, and that is exactly what we saw even on ICG in a more invasive way that the vessels were leaking outside the area of the leak as well as in the fellow eyes which did not have leak. So that obviously brought that like brought us to the understanding that the choroid is more leaky in these patients and why is it leaking? Probably this is engorged and there is congestion that is why it is leaking and then we looked into the vortex vein and the whole thing went one after all. yeah. Great. Any other questions? Yeah, please. So, so there are so many uh, choroidal imaging modalities that are measured. If you were to say one, the one of the most practical choroidal imaging for our community, then about colleagues, which one would you say would be most useful for now or a combination of? Of course, I know that's the easiest to determine, but um, if you were to pick one, say, the CSR, uh, which one would you say? Um, the question here is that which is one of one imaging modality which you will pick uh, for treating patients who probably have choroidal diseases. 
So if you are thinking about having non-invasive, which is the usual uh, preference, I would really go for structural on fast OCT by using a strep source because strep source OCT just gives us not only the great cross-sectional data, but also an on fast data, which is fantastic, as good as the ICG. So I would just pick one, only that. Yeah. That would make sense because you're talking about combination of vessels. You fit in the fact of vessel yes. plus the direction of the vessels. Yes. 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 So I think that's great. Yeah. Thank that's you. Right. Thank you. All right. There is a question in the chat here. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I couldn't follow it. Is there any correlation between choroidal factors and anthropometric factors? Hmm. So uh, I think one of the challenge of anthropometric factors is that it also influences so much the eyeball itself. And eyeball axial length is more, so, so the axial length is higher, so the choroid is going to be thinner. So I think there is a lot of overlap of the things going on in the eye, as well as in the choroid, as well as in the body. So I would say, yes, there is certainly a present uh, a correlation of various factors, especially anthropometric factors, also in the eye, similar to what we see in terms of axial length or AC depth or lens thickness and many other things. Okay. We've got a hand from Dr. Kaplan. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask, amazing talk, by the way, um, okay. but I was going to ask, you know, that those photos that you that you showed showing the choroidal arteries and veins were, were beautiful. Um, and, you know, has there been a lot of um, sub, sub segmentation in terms of different diseases, in terms of how arteries, how these choroidal arteries and veins, um, you know, uh, dilate or look different with different pathologies exactly? Like a have we gone that granular yet? In terms uh, of yeah, that's that's a great question. And I think that is what the goal is. We got Elliot set around one and a half year ago, and we are still trying to change the camera, uh, which obviously needs to have much higher resolution to understand the flow. So we aren't there yet, but we can definitely differentiate the arteries and veins. And right now I have a couple of projects going on and hoping to submit to Academy where we are trying to do look into the CSR patients and see that how the choroidal arteries and the veins are different compared to the healthy eyes. So maybe I may be able to answer your question in the next four years because it is going to take really long time to um, look at the effect of the coffee in the morning. And, you know, it's so difficult to bring patients without coffee and make sure that they take the elevator, don't climb the stairs. And yeah, there's so many factors affecting the choroid. It's impossible to uh, neutralize all of them. The other thing that I find so interesting about the choroid is, you know, the, like you were kind of alluding to, the variation between people. You know, when you look at the retinal circulation, it's much more standardized than, you know, how, a, how the choroidal vasculature looks between patients. And and I was wondering, you know, when you look at the, the OCT databases for RNFL uh, um, thickness between patients, you know, there's a huge variation with what it classifies as green versus red. And a lot of that's based on, you know, inaccuracies with, with how, um, you know, how large their normative database was or, you know, where the RNFL kind of inserts into the nerve. And you know, I was wondering how many patients... <laughs> How many patients does it require to kind of establish these normative data databases? Because I can imagine with the cord, it's probably massive, you know, in terms of that variation. Um, I, I think that's a very practical question, which is, uh, I would say, uh, we should, I mean, you should talk to my team because they always complain that, A, the data is less, the data is poor. How do we segment this? And this is why the last few slides were that uh, we have, we are, we obviously, last seven, eight years have made a huge difference because now we are using the deep learning methods, A, to ide identify the borders, improve the quality, do the automated segmentation, and not only that, to automated validation of the segmentation. So your question is right that, you know, how many patients do we need? But at the same time, I can um, give you the assurance that now that we have worth like almost 15 years of data, 
with the help of super resolution, we are aiming to segment all this data for various diseases because one of the biggest weaknesses like you were alluding uh, with the normative database, which is available in devices, is that those normative database was for normative data, normal patients. But as soon as you put an AMD, the RNFL segmentation goes haywire just because the, the retinal architecture is so different. So the algorithm is just confused. But at the, this is the biggest challenge even for us when we are working on the choroid. And I think this is this is going to take much longer time, but at the same time, I'm pretty confident that we are there in terms of all the techniques available in terms of segmenting the choroid in various diseases. And at this point of time, my focus is AMD, CSR, um, and diabetic retinopathy. So we are hoping to train all these models with the disease data set, set as well to improve the quantification uh, segmentation. Got it. Very exciting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, on that note, I will ask Dr. Yan to close this out, but I do want to thank you uh, for just a wonderful presentation. And, and I think the amount of engagement and questions reflects just how um, you know interesting your talk was this morning. So thank you for that. And Dr. Yan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chaparani. And, and as we all know, the choroid is the next frontier of uh, imaging as uh, imaging modality continues to improve. And I'm sure the choroid can actually predict our cardiovascular health, given mm. its high flow and uh, and its ability to do that, so and so is all thanks to people like you who contribute to this field and that we're able to utilize so many different imaging modalities. But there's so many now; it's getting confusing. So I have the uh, the sort of pleasure to stay here and take your brains and ask you questions Anytime. during resident round. And uh, we have a lot of community ophthalmologists who texted me. I want to invite you to their home so you can give them a lecture on the practical treatments for choroidal disease. Well, again, we thank you very much for being here and thanks everyone for attending this lecture. Uh, so the rest of the time, we'll continue with the resident. Thank lecture. you. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks everyone. Everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day.